Um, thank you so much for coming today. Um, on behalf of Impact Austin, my name is Carrie Mayer, and I'd like to welcome you all to exploring equity in the disability world. Um, this is a continuing education series for our board as well as our current and prospective members. Uh, I've been with the organization for just over a year. I moved to Austin, I guess it's been almost two years now, and I really wanted to get involved in social impact in the nonprofit community. And if it had a focus on women, that would be a huge bonus. Um, I quickly heard about Impact Austin and was blown away by the longstanding impact that this giving circle has had on the Austin community and was even more impressed by the commitment and the prowess of the women involved. Um, last year, I served on the Social Innovation Grant Review Committee, which is one of our committees that reviews the grants that we give out each year. Um, and this year, I joined the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, um, DEIB for short, um, committee. And we are the group that hosts this series. Um, so we've been working diligently to enhance and improve our organization's commitment to education, to membership, to grants with a DEIB focus. Um, our first equity webinar series occurred during Impact Austin's Discovery Days earlier this year. And at those, we explored equity through a racial lens. We had over 110 attendees for our history of race and racism in Central Texas, and 106 attendees for our diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging and action events. Um, this went over very well. We had a keen interest in continuing the equity exploration. And as you know, today we're gonna to be focusing on ableness. The remaining 2021 webinars will dig into equity through other often overlooked lenses, um, age and gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, for those who aren't aware of who we are, Impact Austin is a local collective women's philanthropic group. Uh, we're open to anyone who is female identifying, uh, who wants to pool their resources to make a bigger impact um, on our community. And to date, we've donated over $7.4 million to Central Texas nonprofits. And that includes 94 high impact grants benefiting 69 nonprofits and their, and their clients. And we really couldn't do this work without the past and, and current members and the needs are greater than they've ever been as you all know. Um, we hope that you'll join us. And if you wanna learn more, you can go to Impact Austin for membership details. If cost is a barrier and you're interested in being involved, please don't hesitate to reach out. We will make it happen. Um, just a few reminders before we kick things off. Um, if everyone in attendance can use the Q&A function, um, that will route your questions to our moderator. Um, and for those of you um, that want to provide comments and support these awesome panelists, you can do so in the chat box, which all of us are familiar with after a year of um, digging into Zoom. Um, we will also be recording um, this information or the discussion today, and we'll have the video on our webpage if you need to reference it after. Um, one other note is that we do have a live transcripts feature on this Zoom. Um, so at the bottom of your toolbar on Zoom, you should see live transcripts for closed captioning. Um, you can click on that. You can move it around if you'd like and change the size. Um, so if any of you need that feature, it is there for you. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to Drew. Drew is an executive pastor um, of the 6,000 person congregation at Antioch Fellowship. He has his own lived experiences, which he's gonna be talking about today, um, and his community positions for those who are differently abled or vast. He's a board member for the Down Syndrome Guild of Dallas. He's a coach for the Miracle League of Frisco and a board member of Disability Rights Texas, the state's protection and advocacy group for individuals with disabilities. And that includes the advancement of mental health concerns. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Drew. Thank you so much, Carrie. And I'm so excited to be a part of today's discussion. Looking very forward to um, being a part uh, of this. And um, so again, welcome to those of you who are a part of this today and um, looking forward to being here. 
Now, I must say, I'm not doing this alone today. I am joined by three other um, ladies or three ladies um, who are going to be a part of this. And so I'd like to bring them into the discussion now and ask um, them to, to tell you their name and then they can also tell you um, about their organization. And then I'll, I'll also ask um, each one of you to share, uh, each one of you ladies to share one thing that you hope to shine a spotlight on during today's discussion. And so with that, I'm going to um, ask the ladies to join us, um, Dr. Mary and Celia and Chelsea. And so um, let me um, ask you to kind of just introduce yourself. So Dr. Mary, if you'll go first and tell us again your name and your organization, and then one thing you hope to shine a spotlight on today. Sure, thank you guys for having me. Uh, my name is Mary Van Hannigan, and I'm the CEO for the ARC of the Capital Area. And we are actually one of the oldest continuously operating nonprofits in Austin. We've been around for almost 72 years. Um, we were founded by parents who had children with different types of intellectual and developmental disabilities, and they wanted to create opportunities for their kids. Um, through school, employment, et cetera. And so from that grassroots movement, we become uh, the local chapter here that we are today. We are part of a national organization. There are state chapters um, across the country that do advocacy work. Um, and then there's the ARC of the U.S. that is in D.C. advocating for the rights of individuals with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities. So, um, we just at a high, high level, we serve 17 counties, over a thousand individuals each year, children and adults. Um, and when I say intellectual and or developmental disability, I'm referring to over a hundred different types of diagnosis. But um, for ones that people are often, um, that are more common, uh, people are aware of, it would be um, a diagnosis of Down syndrome, maybe um, autism or on the spectrum, cerebral palsy, um, just to name uh, a few. And so, we serve, like I mentioned, about a thousand individuals across 17 counties, and we provide services in continuing education outside of the school system, so post-secondary education, employment. We help uh, with case management, which helps people uh, living at home uh, be as independent as possible. And then we also work within the school systems to help young individuals who are aging out. So at a very high level, that's what we do. So that's, that is us. And one thing um, that I would like to spotlight um, is, is overall, I guess, awareness um, and to, you know, not necessarily judge a book by its cover. So. Thank you for the work that you do, Mary, and um, welcome to today's discussion. Uh, Celia, let's hear from you. You're on mute, Celia. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Celia Hughes, and I'm the executive director of ArtSpark Texas. Some of you may have worked with us in the past uh, as VSA Texas. Uh, we uh, changed our name two years ago, and, but we still do the same work that we have always done. Um, we are an arts organization, an advocacy organization, and a uh, arts organization all rolled into one. We're unique in Texas uh, for that reason. Uh, we use the arts, all art forms, to uh, empower uh, young adults uh, and adults uh, up into the senior years to uh, discover and use their voice for positive change. Uh, we also encourage people just to uh, look at the arts as a, as a form of relaxation, a form of connection, something to use to find uh, meaning and value in their lives and uh, throughout their family and their community. Uh, through this pandemic, we have uh, been able to reach uh, across the state and actually have pulled in people from across the nation to participate in our classes. We offer art classes, uh, movement and dance classes, music classes, and we work also with veterans, uh, older adults, and, uh, and mostly uh, ages 16 and up. We don't do a lot with the younger ages um, for a number of reasons, but we do uh, start our programming rigorously at age 16 and up. 
We've been in Austin since 1996, and uh, we were a part of a national organization, VSA. The VSA network has disbanded, so we all now operate as uh, independent organizations. Uh, but the national office still exists at the Kennedy Center, so you will see things uh, come out from the Kennedy Center with the VSA uh, logo. Delighted to be here today, and what I hope is that people will today feel more confident and more assured and comfortable uh, when speaking with people with disabilities and speaking about their programs and their services uh, to include people with disabilities. Thank you, Celia. Thank you for the work that you do and excited that you're a part of today's discussion. And um, last but certainly not least, Chelsea, let's hear from you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Chelsea Elliott and I'm the founder and executive director of Half Helen, which is a local nonprofit that exists to help children see clearly. We started providing vision screenings. We're, <laughs> we're the youngest organization here today, uh, celebrating our eighth year this year. We started out providing vision and hearing screenings in schools and in the next 23 days, we'll be launching our very first mobile vision clinic, a 32 foot tiny house on wheels trailer that'll be traveling around throughout Central Texas, providing comprehensive eye exams and glasses to children that otherwise would not have access to it. So very excited. We're actually also a 2019 health and well-being grant recipient from Impact Austin. And so we owe Impact Austin our ability to help children see clearly. You guys helped us get where we are today. And one thing I'm really hoping to get to uh, shine a spotlight on today is as a woman living with irreversible vision and hearing loss, I would love to help the, the audience see that we're not, just because we're differently able, we're not helpless. And so helping bring to light our desire for independence and ways that the audience can help us be seen and independent. Thank you, Chelsea, and welcome to today's discussion. So glad that you're here. Thank you for the work that you do as well. As we um, jump into our discussion for today, um, I'd like to remind those who are um, watching the webinar, um, maybe those of you who even joined late, um, like to share with you that the question and answer feature is open to you. So we encourage you, um, if there are um, questions that you have as we're going through the discussion, to drop those into the question and answer box. And as we monitor that, we would love to um, engage in dialogue um, centered around any questions that you may have. So feel free to use that, um, the question and answer feature. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, so as uh, we heard through the introduction of today's webinar, um, this is kind of born out of the, and I guess the acronym is the DEIB committee, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Committee, uh, Impact Austin. So as we're kind of walking through this discussion today, I'd like to kind of just lay some um, foundations, some, some ground um, groundwork here, and let's kind of talk about equity. And so to each one of you, um, spend just a minute or two talking about what equity means to you. Um, and feel free to kind of jump in here. I won't necessarily call on one of you, but if you have, if you want to share with us what equity means to you, just, just dive right in. I'll, I'll start. All right. Non-planned because I went first before. Um, it, I think it's a, for me, it's something that can be a little bit difficult to articulate, but um, I saw this image. I'm going to try and describe it. Um, and it was, I think it, bear with me, but it was little cartoon people and they were, I think, watching a baseball game and there was a fence. I'm probably not doing this justice, but there was a fence along the way and it, it described um, Ultimately, the end slide was uh, equity. And what that was is not every, so in the first slide, everybody was able to see the game, right? They're, or at least they're up at a fence and they're in the front row, right? So that would be their, their equal opportunity, right? To be able to be at the game and then be in the front row. And there's a couple more slides. And then the last slide, um, because the heights are different for people and because of a variety of other things, you see that, uh, um, one person has a stool, another person, so they can all eventually see the game from the same perspective, I guess. Um, I mean, that's not the right word, but um, it's more than just having a, 
an opportunity. It's having an opportunity with the tools that you need um, to be, you know, at the game, I guess. I, I don't know if that makes any sense in this, in this context, but uh, uh, maybe I'll look to a pitcher and I'll show it later. So they'll do it better justice, but I like I'll turn it. it over to someone else. I like it. <laughs> Great, Mary. That's, you know, that's a, a, a cartoon that we often use when we're trying to talk to teachers in schools about what's the difference between an accommodation and a modification to what they're doing in their classroom. And, you know, the, and the idea is that you've got a fence that not everyone can see over, which is your curriculum or your lesson plan. And so you give someone a stool and they can see over the fence, but some people can't get on the stool, can't use the stool. And so, you know, equitable is, you know, lowering the fence so that everyone can see over the fence. And that's what I feel about um, with equity is that it's such a fine line between what is it that we're providing and and are, do we have to fundamentally change what it is that we're providing or our services in order to be equitable? And I would say that, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act says, no, we don't want, you know, people are so afraid that there's going to be, a, you know, they're going to have to, to, you know, lower the fence as it were. But, but it's really looking at your program so that everyone can per engage and participate at the level that is the most comfortable to them. And so looking at how, what is it that you're doing and where are some of the barriers, where are some of the challenges, and what are some of the modifications, what are some of the accommodations that you can provide that don't fundamentally alter what it is that you're doing, but just makes it more accessible so that more people multiple points of entry, as we like to say, that more people can come in and engage and participate at a level that's comfortable to them. And that's what I think equity is. I like that. And I'm going to, um, Dr. Mary was, um, she made herself a, a bit vulnerable. Yep. And so I'm going to kind of jump in here and, and do something I ordinarily wouldn't do. So I have, a, um, I have a 10 year old son and my son has Down syndrome. And so he watches a wide array of things on his iPad um, during his screen time. And so um, I've, you know, kind of picked up on the tunes and I know them when I hear like the theme music. And um, as soon as it starts out, you know, it's a uh, baby shark doo 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 doo. And so I know that one when I hear it. And then there's, are you ready kids? And I know that's gonna be SpongeBob, but there's one, and here's my reason for bringing this whole thing up is there's one that he watches and even on this kid show, it helped me to understand equity is just a way of thinking. It's uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a mindset. And so he was watching Daniel Tiger, and Daniel Tiger said this, and it stuck with me. And now I even use this in conversations like this. Um, Daniel Tiger said, "In some ways we are different, but in so many ways we are the same." And so for me, that's what equity is. Equity is a level of understanding of, in some ways, we really are different, but in so many ways, we are the same. So um, I just want to kind of say that, that that's kind of my um, thought about equity is it's, it's a mindset. Chelsea, uh, were you going to share something here as it relates to what does equity mean to you? I don't think I could say it better than Daniel Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect. And I was just going to add that equity to me is kind of illumin or eliminating the assumption that we're helpless and that we've like speaking as someone who is differently able with my visual and hearing impairments uh not being automatic not assuming that i need to be placed in that handicap like the very clearly left uh, identified handicap section Whereas with just giving me a choice, let me choose where I want to be, where I'm most comfortable. And but Daniel, excellent choice on Daniel Tiger. Good deal. So again, uh, for those of you who are watching, want to encourage you to take advantage of the question and answer feature if there are any questions that you want to drop in there um, as we monitor those going through our discussion. Um, Celia, I have a question for you. Um, as we're kind of talking through this, we've talked about equity. Um, so here's a question I have. Uh, what are the most impactful ways 
that um, impact Austin members can create both awareness and support for ableness within the community, would you say? You're on mute, Celia. I thought I wasn't on mute. <laughs> Um, I'd like to get a little clarification on the question in terms sure. of um, support for ableness. Um, in terms, are you saying how to support people uh, understanding their ableness and how it impacts uh, society? Okay. Um, you know, we've been having so many conversations this past year on a number of ways that all of us are beginning to reflect and evaluate our place in uh in the greater society and even our place in 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 uh, our organizations and um one of the things that we it seems like with this conversation today are beginning to realize is that there is also um an able-bodied uh mindset that so many of our programs are built around without um not consciously uh it's done unconsciously um we have for so many many years thought about people with disabilities as the other or um, having to provide supports that are going to be too expensive or that we don't have any concept of what they are and so i think that people just um, need to start to listen listen to people with disabilities, uh, hear what they have to say, hear the things that they are asking for, for supports within the community, um, and then um, following up on those, uh, reflecting on how this actually um, um, affects you as an individual. Um, you know, we, we classically always say that curb cuts was fought vehemently. No one wanted curb cuts and now everyone uses curb cuts. Um, door openers. People don't like to use, you know, organizations Viet vehemently oppose automatic door openers, but everybody uses them. You've got your arms full of packages. I do it all the time. I hit the door opener with my elbow, the door opens. Now the post office doors just magically open. Um, so we all benefit from this. And and so I think what I would say that for people to really begin to uh, pay attention to how society and our built environment and our programs and all of that are really have really been designed for people who can see and hear and don't have to use wheelchairs and have full use of their hands, all of that and how, um, how easy it would be for us as a society to to make some slight uh, changes, some slight adaptations in our programming uh, to make it a more accessible uh, world uh, for for everyone. Thank you for that. So I have a follow up question um, for you, Celia. This one was dropped into the um, question and answer box. And this one is more, a little bit more specifically tied to ArtSpeak, um, ArtSpark, I'm sorry. And so here's, here, let me just read the question. Um, hi, a follow-up question for Celia. I'm a college student interested in DEIB education for elementary school students, specifically on conversations around disability. What are some reasons that ArtSpark doesn't target younger children? And what opportunities do you see uh, with art and the DEIB education for children under the age of 16? The reason we don't target younger children is because there are other organizations in town who uh, do that. We worked with younger children, but the, um, the uh, ratio of adult to child supervision in a class is, is higher. And we found that um, youth that are aging out of high school, um, many times there was nothing there for them. Uh, there were no programs that is changing, thankfully. But so we decided that we would focus on that niche of, of youth to help, uh, help guide them from their schooling years to their work and community years. Um, 
we do we do work with teachers though we are a partner with a with AISD Austin Independent School District and an organization named MindPop and I personally train about a thousand uh, teachers every year uh, and those are mostly special education teachers in um, including the arts in their classroom practices how to use uh, art strategies so we are in a way serving uh, young people because we're working with the teachers who engage with them every day. Thank you for that additional clarity. So Dr. Mayor, I'm gonna put you on the spot for a second. Um, when we met, um, I guess it was last week or the week before, you um, told me something, I, I don't, you probably don't know this. You educated me on something I did not know. Many of us have heard of the Ark of Texas, heard of the Ark of the Capital area. We've heard of your organization, but I never knew what ARC originally stood for. Can you share that with us? And I'm going somewhere with this based on a question that just came in. So the ARC, ARC originally stood for what? Uh, so yeah, so in 1949, when we were formed, we were the Association for Retarded Children, and then the name changed to Association for Retarded Citizens, and then uh, I think there's a few more in between there, but eventually uh, it, we lost the acronym and it just became the ARC, but for a very long time, you know, and, and it does go, I, I, I read the question, I won't, I won't steal the thunder there, but, um, you know, the terminology around diagnosing someone with an intellectual disability um, clinical, these are clinical diagnosis, so mentally retarded, and there is variations of mental retardation, and that was a clinical medical term, and a lot of negative connotation over the years associated with that changed the, um, how we define that, even from a clinical setting, so, um, and you'll see that over, over time, I mean, if you, um, I did, I had an opportunity to do some historical type research in one of the first schools here in the country was School for Idiots. And so idiot was actually a clinical term for mental retardation prior to being called mental retardation. So a lot of the terms that we, you know, we use in everyday, hopefully not everyday language, but, you know, that um, it, it's from those clinical diagnosis phasing out and then the stigma of that, you know, being um, associated with it. So over time, our organizations like ours, you know, try and advocate yeah. for people to become more aware of, you know, the, the, the change, the change in, you know, terminology. Yeah. Wow. Did not know that there was a school called the school, essentially the school for idiots. That's wow. So let me kind of share the question and we can kind of engage in this conversation. So the question is, this: we're learning a lot about words. We're learning that language matters and that descriptions are a matter of preference. How do each of you prefer to or describe people with disabilities, other abled, et cetera? I think that's an excellent question. Um, um, Dr. Mary, you kind of um, shared some, some insight there. Any more you wanna say before we hear from Celia and or Chelsea? I think the two things that, that come to mind that uh, as, you know, we're trying to be more cognizant and listen to our constituents, the families and the individuals who provide services too. It's uh, something as simple as, you know, this person or this individual experiences, let's say Down syndrome versus, you know, they are <laughs> or they have, it's an experience of, of a different, you know, kind of variation of the world. Um, so, and then um, like generalize, I suppose, if I was talking to someone at large, we still use special needs, even though I don't think in certain circles it's um, because we also work with, with kids and that's still the diagnosis, uh, whatever they, how it's called, if you're in special education, there's an association there helping people who aren't familiar with what we do, sometimes we'll refer in that regard. But um, for the most part, we, we refer to people as differently abled. Yeah. And again, that might just be more of a preference for, for us, um, you know, but um, it's also not, it, uh, I, uh, I think oftentimes people are afraid to ask because they don't want to say something wrong or they're afraid to say something. I think it's better to, um, you know, I was in a meeting with a parent and uh, who has a child with Down syndrome, and we were talking about his transition to adulthood and leaving the school system. And I had someone who represented our organization, and I'm not going to name names, but and they were not an employee, but they were a volunteer member of sorts, okay? And um, they kept saying at the meeting, 
well, I know your boy's got downs. I know he's got the downs. And so I had to um, like elbow him 17 times and then afterwards explain. And then I was, you know, embarrassed that somebody who was, you know, representing our organization, but that's, you know, for that individual, that was how he had been taught or thought was appropriate. And it was really offensive to, to, to the parent he was talking to, you know, um, it's Down syndrome, there's a variety of other things. And so, um, but it's, it's better to, to have that dialogue, right? And then that, and the, that, that, that person I'm referring to, I guarantee never made that mistake again. And, and they understood after the fact, it was kind of an awkward lesson to have to probably learn, but, um, and it gave us some perspective on how we want to train people um, coming in and who are working with us. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop talking today. Celia, Chelsea, either one of you want to jump in there um, as it relates to um, this question? I, I have vision and hearing loss, but I don't see myself as disabled. And okay. so that word irritates me beyond all belief. Okay. Uh, I am definitely differently abled. I come about the world a different way. I liked how Dr. Mary described it as it's, a, it's an experience. My vision loss is an experience. I can't tell you the number of times that when speaking to parents or community members about half Helen's work and providing vision care, people will use the expression like, oh my God, I'm so blind, or I'm like blind as a bat. And I was like, are you though? Or do you have a refractive air, which is a type of visual impairment? Uh, so it's just like kind of being like cognizant of the fact there's a very significant difference, like a, a technical difference between being visually impaired, like needing to needing correction, which is a refractive air. Uh, being myopic, uh, having hyperopia, farsightedness, or astigmatism versus having irreversible vision loss. This is actually a prosthetic. I had my eye removed when I was 15. And so when I interact with the differently able community at first glance, they don't understand why I'm there. They think that I'm, I don't belong because I don't look the part when in reality it's when you get to know me and you notice my mannerisms how occasionally I'll, I'll turn my head even today because I am blind in one eye and deaf in one ear so I can see you but it's easier for me to hear you at an angle and I love that there is the live transcript on this because occasionally it's really difficult for me as a person with vision and hearing loss to participate especially if we're in a group setting so all right I think Dr. Mary nailed it all right silly anything you want to jump in and say there <laughs> Yeah, I just, I just want to say that uh, this is a very complex conversation, uh, the whole identity. Um, it, within the disability community, there, it's, there's a huge conversation going on. Um, you know, for, for ne many years now, we've had people first language where we've referred to the person uh, first. Um, you know, I wrote a little hierarchy here. How do I want to be referred to? I want to be referred to as Celia, you know, and then then maybe I, you know, then I'll be, uh, you know, I am a person with a certain disability or experiencing or lives with. That's another one that people say um, within the community itself. People are really taking back their taking back the names and they're 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 disabled. I am a disabled person. I am the, you know, and then I learned doing my research for um, for this panel that differently abled is actually a term that uh, many people within the autism community really prefer. Um, and because I've heard that and didn't know really where it fit in. So again, it's a very complex uh, uh conversation to be had. And I think that uh, Dr. Mary saying that, you know, ask, have the conversation. I mean that because the person with the disability is, we can tell you how they want to be referred and everyone is unique. Everyone is different. Everyone has their own uh, way of wanting to be identified. And so it's just, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to have that conversation. conversation. Um, you know, if you make a mistake, you know, the world isn't going to come to an end. You just, we just want to, you know, we just want to move forward. Thank you for that. So Chelsea, uh, tell us a little bit about the mission of Half Helen, and then I guess the greatest challenges you um, face or experience in executing your mission. So 
Half Helen's mission is to help children see clearly. And we started that process by providing screenings. The first step in any vision care journey is to identify if there's a potential vision impairment or vision loss. And we realized that screening is not enough. There are resources out there to provide a screening, but there are fewer resources to provide a comprehensive eye exam, which if a child does have a visual impairment, that's the next step in the spectrum of care. So we decided that there wasn't any other mobile vision care provider in town and have Helen as a as a young organization, plus as a, a leader with my own visual vision loss, uh, I was like, I could step up to fix this challenge because the vast majority of vision related impairment are refractive errors. So we launched a pop-up style clinic that provided on-site eye exams to children in schools because we wanted to remove cost or transportation related barriers to care. And with COVID, gaining access to schools became a, a challenge and especially bringing in an external team. So we decided to use the funding resources we had available to build our own 32 foot tiny house on wheels mobile clinic that it will have two lanes on board and we'll be able to provide about 40 eye exams a day and really address the refractive error, which is a growing problem with the more screen time that we're facing. Our eyes are actually adapted for distance vision, not near. And so the more time we spend in front of a screen, we're seeing conditions like digital eye strain or um, dry eye syndrome uh, appear. And actually children are coming to us with more progressive prescriptions than where they should be. So it's kind of at a point where we really need to get in there and start addressing, or at least slowing down the progression of vision issues. And the second part of your question in terms of challenges. Uh, finding kids. Hmm. Like there's a concern. There's still a myth that glasses mean that or glasses are stupid. No one wants to wear them. It's a, an obstruction. And I, I, glasses actually become my trademark. That's how people now find me in crowds or in communities. And I'm the girl with glasses. Um, but, uh, COVID, yeah. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Dr. Mary, I'm going to come to you kind of along this same, um, same question. Um, would you talk to us about the arc of the capital area and how the pandemic has impacted you, um, the, your, or your operations of the organization, if at all? Um, there's an assumption that it, it's impacted all of us. So talk to us about how it's impacted uh, your organization. Well, that's a, that could be a loaded <laughs> the answer on my part, but uh, the short version. Um, so we're, we're a human service agency um, and uh, uh, the population that we serve historically has been isolated um, in a variety of different ways. And so they're very vulnerable to that without the right tools and supports. Um, and so COVID is the biggest thing that did for the people we provide services to is put them in a a position that many of us didn't, when COVID first hit, we all were impacted. But the difference was is that if I wanted to, to, to I was gonna say, if I was frustrated with my husband, I could get in the car and I could go drive down the street, right? And I could burn off steam, right? Before when we didn't know what was going on and all these things, or, or I could go and I could take a walk to the park. Um, and, and on my walk, I could call my girlfriend, you know, or I could send a text message to my mom, you know, whatever it might be. And so even though we were all restricted and, you know, in this place of uncertainty, many of the individuals that we worked with, A, didn't have a full understanding. I don't think anyone had a full understanding of what was happening and why it was happening, why the routine had changed, why, the, you know, the, they didn't have access to the same things that they had before. And then um, anxiety, depression, it, it, it hit way faster, I think, for the people we were providing services to even more so than the rest of us. Cause even the basic stuff, many of our clients didn't prior to this have cell phones or laptops, you know, or if they're going to leave the house, they have to have someone go with them. Maybe they live in a group home and that's the rules, you know, even if they're capable of it. And so some of the most basic things that, that, that I personally had to take advantage of during this, when it first started, our clients couldn't. And so we shifted to virtual service delivery. And one of our, it's not one of our largest programs, and it's probably not even one of our programs we're most well-known for. We have a post-secondary education program. Um, we had about 75 students enrolled 
and uh, we work on a number of topics. And within two weeks of COVID, we were able to go online. But it was no easy task. And not only did we have to get the technology that we hadn't been prepared to give or you know, get, then we had to train individuals remotely um, who you know may have some issues. Maybe multiple step instruction is difficult, you know, or they're at home, you know, with their 85 year old mom who you know has never really used a computer. And so the biggest challenge was the fact that we're a people oriented organization and we couldn't be in in the same place with people. What we've learned in in hindsight to that is. Um, there's a really there's a place for this. There's a place for this for people um, who maybe don't like large groups or um, we've seen there's a lot of pros and a lot of a lot of cons. But we had to get really creative on how do we still serve the people in the best ways we can with this technological jump. Um, I mean, if, well, there, if you Google it, there's a ton of things about individuals with disabilities, specifically intellectual disabilities not having access to technology. So it was a big kind of um, prior to this, right? Kind of jump, but um, short version, uh, it was a little difficult because we wanted to see each other in person. But at the end of the day, we figured out how to get creative and work around this. And um, and now we're actually looking at, um, what, so we've been working remotely for over a year and this is probably too long of an answer, so I'll try and wrap it up. But our case managers, which we're driving about 70,000 miles each year. Um, and now we're able to reduce that by doing things like having a Zoom meeting, you know, different ways to, and we can serve, access more people, our employees, even employees that live, you know, two, three hours from here. Um, they're able to serve their region without, and everyone came to our office before, Monday through Friday. And so it's really allowed us to, um, look at, at how we deliver services and who we deliver services to. And we're focusing on um, areas like unincorporated Travis County, more rural areas. So it's, um, and our plan is we're actually piloting this post-secondary education program to, to be basically satellite sites throughout central Texas. So we have everyone coming to our main building and we only have two people that are even in the city residing. Everyone else is coming from these other places. And so we're going to start a satellite program down at the Wildflower Center, um, an outdoor kind of, it's going to be art-based, but also healing and health. And But we, we hadn't really thought to do that per se prior to this. So it's, you know, um, we're going to go to where our clients are and serve them in person while maintaining the, the virtual services so that we can have something for everybody. So in some ways it was a challenge, but also uh, I think a really good learning opportunity for us as an organization. Yeah, and I think many of our organizations have been the same way. Um, the pandemic caused us to really have to rethink how it, um, how we, um, how we interact and how we complete the mission of our organizations. And in some ways, we've had to kind of reshape that. And now we're thinking, okay, maybe after the pandemic has um, subsided, um, for the most part, this may be our new norm that we may be a little bit more efficient in this new way of operating. I like that. Can I mention one other thing? Sorry, I I just uh, I don't want to I don't want to be that guy or that girl or stuff. I don't want to be the person dominating the conversation. But I just had to mention one other thing. Um, when you have an intellectual disability or a developmental disability, the the normal transition from school it may not look the same as as other other kids, right? And so you may not be on track to go to college and then go get a job. You may be on track to to do a certificate program. You may be on track. A lot of a lot of individuals, a lot of kids coming out of school, there's a big cliff. And it's like, well, what do I do now? Because they've been protected under the IDEA Act in the school system. And so there's been a lot going on in the news about parents not being able to return to work because of child care. And in some ways, not referring to the people we're providing service to as children, but there are a number of individuals that we serve whose parents need a place for their ch adult children to go so that they can do things like work. Um, and so it's, a, it's another, um, I guess I just want to mention it because people don't often think about, um, about the need for that, that it's multifaceted, not only for the individual to be at a place where they can continue to grow and learn and be challenged, but also for their, their care providers, which are often their parents, um, to be able to have an opportunity to, 
uh, it's, it's impacted a lot of the families that have had to quit their jobs and stay home. Because even with the virtual classes we're providing for some individuals that work, but for other individuals, you know, they, they really need, you know, um, the in-person programming, you know, so. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about resources. Um, I'd like to kind of, um, I guess, pitch this question um, to each of you um, to, to see if there are any resources that you find helpful for public awareness um, that would be beneficial to our conversation um, right now. Um, so Silly, let, let's hear from you. Are, do you. are there any resources that you're aware of that we should probably mention during this, this discussion? Well, I first wanna um, refer back to what Dr. Mary was just talking about because that the struggle that the ARC went through and that a lot of organizations went through and particularly organizations that serve people uh, with all kinds of disabilities uh, was that we not only had to think about just, I mean, for some companies, it was just like, how do we go virtual? How do we do what we do virtual? But, you know, to bring it back to the topic of equity, we had to really think about what's going to be well, how are we going to serve everyone and meet their needs and try to create as equitable as a, a um, response to this pandemic as possible? Because as Dr. Mary said, a lot of the folks didn't have access to technology, still don't. I mean, we work with older adults that, you know, there's a huge uh, lack of access to technology there. Uh, people don't have access to you know, broadband to internet, that sort of thing. So, you know, so equity really came into play. I know in my organization, and I'm going to assume of, over at the arc of the capital area in terms of how do we serve everyone? You know, what is the way that we're going to do this? And that's the conversations that continue in terms of now what? Now that we've done it for a year and we've really, as uh, Dr. Mary said, we've discovered the pros and the cons to this, how do we move forward? Because we don't wanna leave behind the people that we added to our service, uh, it, you know, to our group by going virtual because transportation is an issue they can't get to where you are. Uh, locations are not accessible. So, you know, they can't get in the door when they get there all those sorts of things. And so the conversations now are, now what? Now what do we do? How are we gonna take the good from both and create some sort of a hybrid model? As far as resources, I think that um, if you wanna learn about language, if you wanna learn about how uh, people with disabilities perceive themselves, the way they wanna be part of the conversation, is to look at um, different uh, groups, reach out to the Down Syndrome Association of Central Texas and, and talk to them, you know, get, get, get what, is their, what is their take on language? How are they moving forward? Um, someone put in the chat, um, uh, ableist language to avoid and acceptable alternatives from a blog called The Rolling Explorer. I would imagine that blog is pretty interesting. Um, we listen to a number of different blogs. So there are uh, blogs that are out there. Disarts out of um, uh, Michigan uh, has, a, they interviewed people with disabilities throughout the entire pandemic. And so you can listen to people's real stories of what, what, how they've been impacted by the pandemic. Um, Again, I think that uh, you can go to like autism, the Autism Society of Austin. I mean, go to those resources, uh, go to the ARC. I'm sure the ARC of the Capital Area has uh, resources on their webpage. I have resources on my webpage. Just start to go out and, and find tips, tip sheets, what language to use. And most importantly, um, talk to someone with a disability. I'm not saying go up to it in the grocery store and, ha and say, hey, can I talk to you about your disability? Um, but it, you know, it, when you're in an environment where that opportunity is presented to you, um, have that conversation. Uh, don't be afraid to have that conversation. And 
The other thing is sometimes people are not going to want to have that conversation. And remember that just because you have a disability doesn't mean that you always have to have a good day. Some days you're going to be grumpy. Some days you're going to be sick of having somebody ask you this question over and over again. So don't take it personally if somebody doesn't want to talk to you or um, is, you know, could be rude. It's just that the people are people and we have good days and bad days. Chelsea, are there any resources you'd like to mention? Uh, I've actually become familiar with the TSBVI, Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. They've created a like vision loss simulation model where they invite community members to come and actually walk in the shoes of like some of their students and then learn about some of the accommodations that have been made available and how what it's like to live in the life, uh, to be, to live, to walk in the shoes of someone with vision loss. So I thought that was really cool. My board of directors are actually going to be participating in that. And it's a safe, exciting opportunity way for you to learn about what our lives are like and to ask questions because you're right. Uh, Celia is right. It's weird being asked. So what's it like to be blind or half blind? I, I don't know. What's it like to have two eyes? It's, it's my reality. And so when you ask questions like that, you, you, it, it brings to light that we're abnormal. And uh, I just wanted to say a resource in mine is the Texas Lions Camp. It's my favorite place in the entire world. And it's a summer camping facility specifically designed for children with physical disabilities. And I believe they serve like over 160 different conditions. And the one thing I love the most is that it's a label-free environment. Every kid who goes there is the attends a one week experience where the entire facility is a thousand percent ADA. So everything is accessible and it's where you get to see kids who are often treated like a burden or like a, a child. It's so easy to slip into this mentality that people like me are helpless and therefore we need to like step in and help them. And then when you offer that help, it's kind of like there's this expectation of reciprocity, reciprocity reciprocal uh, behavior where you help them now you want them to explain to you why they needed help and it's I just remembering that expectation shouldn't be there gotcha gotcha thank you and so there's one more question we want to get to um, just before that Dr. Mary any resources any resources you want to um, throw out for the group no I think that that, that covers it uh, there is also the Texas Council on Developmental Disabilities um, and then there is the Disability uh, Coalition. Okay. I don't think I said that right, but those are two other good ones. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. So here's our last question um, for the day. Um, our last question is this, how can Impact Austin members be a representative ally for um, your or our organizations? Um, are there any, um, I guess, things that we wanna pitch here um, for your organization um, as it relates to Impact Austin members? I can start. Um, go ahead, Celia. Go ahead, Celia. Chelsea, do you want to go first? <laughs> um, just basically, one easy thing to do is um, put uh, access and accommodation in the, uh, as, a pri as, as one of the uh, priorities in your funding. Um, when you're issuing uh, RFPs and, so, and things like that, um, ask the question is, how are you serving uh, people with disabilities? Um, and just, and, and so, that it, so that it becomes something that people think of in their program design. Uh, so that's not something that's an add-on. Uh, and that's, that's a simple thing to add uh, to your application um, when you're, uh, thinking about that in the future when you're putting together your applications. Because again, it's really so much easier to um, design for accommodation rather than to try to band-aid it on after a program has been started. So I think that's one easy thing that, uh, the, that the, the group could do. Thank you. Um, Chelsea, how about you? I was gonna say, come get involved, come see what we're talking about. It's the first step to seeing, experiencing, and then start changing the attitude. And then there's always the, if you see someone that you perceive to need assistance, ask, ask before assuming. 
Let me get it. All right. Dr. Mary. Um, one of the initiatives that we're working on is, uh, and I didn't include it when we talked about um, definitions, I guess, or ways to refer to individuals who may experience a different type of disability. But one of the terms that we use is neurodiversity. And um, we're working to lead the way for employers to be more neurodiverse. And there's lots of ways that companies and corporations are addressing uh, diversity, um, but neurodiversity isn't something that's always considered there. And so I just wanna read um, one sentence and so that's what, in my mind, you could do is, um, you know, help create opportunities by having this kind of lens about neurodiversity. So um, this neurodiversity is the idea that neurological differences like autism and uh, ADHD are the result of normal natural variations in the human genome. And that's by John Elder uh, Bobson, from who's the co-chair of a bunch of stuff and he works at the university and I won't go into all his credits, but it's, um, it's, it's normal, I guess, uh, just that what we're talking about is normal and, um, you know, disabilities don't discriminate. Um, and at any point in time, you may have a disability or someone you know will have a disability. I mean, it's, so looking at it as more, um, uh, I guess, normal and trying to create opportunities like Celia had said for things like universal design. So when you're approaching a situation, because universal design, you know, that's the, the curb being cut out. That's the, that's the, you know, having, um, you know, your speak to text, have a go, you know, or having a sign language interpreter, whatever that might be. Um, just if those things become common, um, I think that that'll make everyone's, you know, interactions more successful. So. Thank you for that. Celia, Dr. Mary, Chelsea, it's been my pleasure as well as an honor to spend this time with you today. Um, for those of you who are watching, I hope that this has been informative for you. I hope that it sparks an interest for you. I hope that you don't just walk away from this conversation and consider yourself an expert by any means. I don't think any of us are. And so I would encourage you to, um, to reach out. Um, Celia mentioned this, reach out to organizations, um, do your own research. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge at our fingertips. Um, to Chelsea's point, don't spend too much time looking at the screen because it's definitely uh, definitely an impact to our eyes. Um, but thank you. Thank you for joining us today. With that, I'm going to toss it back to Carrie. Thank you, Drew. And thank you so much to you and, and Chelsea, Celia, and Dr. Mary for your unwavering commitment to um, the community of people who are differently abled. We really appreciate your time and all the incredible insights on lived experiences and your roles in supporting the community. Uh, we have another, um, another webinar. So for everyone that's on the call, our next session will be exploring this, the spectrum of age bias on July 16th at noon. So July 16th at noon, mark your calendar, save the date, we hope you can join us. And if you are a current Impact Austin member, feel free to step in and join us on the DEIB committee if you're interested. Um, with that, I'll close out. Thank you all so much for staying curious and, and wanting to stay informed. We hope this has been fruitful as Drew mentioned, and we hope to see you at the next session. Have a good weekend, everyone.